I don't even know if I'm going to lead anything here, really, but uh, I wanted to ask you the question about the neutral frame of reference that you used uh, to derive the whole proof of data. Um, yeah. So yeah, go for that, man. Okay. Uh, well, do you have a specific question about it, or did you just want me to talk about it? Just talk about it, and like we'll we'll pick up like as you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically, the idea is like. Uh, there's no way to have observed what we're talking about. There is no way to observe it because you'd have to be outside the system. And the system is everything, is the idea. Beautiful. Right? So this is only a theoretical construct. Right. But we can say, for the purposes of the thought experiment of considering the possibility, nice. that if there was nothing, then like because we're talking about it and it's just a thought experiment we are outside of that proposition so right. then we can we can act as a neutral observer not affected by the by the you know Content thing we're proposing you. yep yep we, we could make the observation that there is something to say right that there yeah. is nothing is something that there is no information is an observation in itself thank you nice right? And so then from there, as soon as you can say, look, you know, like the point is you have to stress the fact that the observer is hypothetical. It's not that someone actually observed it and that thus all of the things came to be. Right. Right. It's like, even though there's no observer, you can theoretically observe the fact that there's nothing to observe. And that's always a logical possibility. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you could make such an observation shows that there is indeed something to observe. And you can't make an observation without information. Otherwise, you're just making stuff up. There and even go. then, how do you make stuff up without information? Right. And that's the uh, the kind of loop of data that allows it to be perceived as eternal. Yeah, definitely. Because that it, that it makes it actually eternal if you think about the reality of the proposition. Yeah, definitely. The fact that, like, it not existing is actually impossible right guarantees its eternality you know what i mean because where could it go if its non-existence is impossible right so now that's such a deceptively simple oversight that i mean we should probably hunker down on that spot right there because i think the fact that we have uh at least within our little groups we've explored just the fact that there's at least four different versions of imaginary nothing or technological nothing like we can categorize the void or the vacuum but we're talking about virtual particles and there's always information there which as you well put. yeah in essence it's um it's the difference between uh something as a concept and something as an instance right so like when you have an instance of beauty it's not that that thing is like all other things that are beautiful you know what i mean it's that right. it shares the trait that what makes things be. beautiful which has yeah which has something to do with proportion and stuff like that sure um it's not you know we don't have a specific formula right. but it's yeah. something along those lines like we the have golden, been able to call the golden ratio it. approximate yeah. It. yeah 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 um so in the same way like when we're talking about nothing we're talking about the absence of things right so we refer to something which exists and we say that it's absent right but yeah. the actual so so then that those are instances of absence and if we take it back to the concept of absence then for that for that definition to be consistent the definition itself shouldn't be there it should also be absent right and the concept mm -hmm. should be absent and you can't have like you can't have an absence that is ultimate because then absence itself would be absent. So, and there would be things. Yeah. So it seems as though when you try to get behind nothing that uh, my son and I actually came up with this idea because the reason I use the omniverse and the zero verse as words is to simplify and reduce the conceptual understandings that we're using as we're using them. So, yeah. Uh, 
I, I told my eight year old son who's here and he might join in on this, but I said, Dante, are you, if, if you were at the edge of the omniverse, looking at the, you know, the zero verse, and if you were to take a step at, out of the edge of, into the void, basically, into the nothingness, do you think the omniverse would grow or that the, um, or that you would, that, that the omniverse would stay where it is and you would step kind of across a fence into the void? Mm -hmm. And what did you say? Mm -hmm. About like, if you were at the edge of the omniverse? I think I said you would disappear. You would disappear? If it was that version. Yeah, like it would, you would stop existing, which is in a way of <laughs> kind of proving that nothingness isn't. But we were wondering about the idea of, even if you tried, if we could physically get to a, an edge of existence to perceive such a thing, if you were to step across that edge, wouldn't it likely just extend the edge? Okay. So <laughs> I, I have two answers to this. The first one is that your child's answer is actually better than yours. Nice. <laughs> the, the, the answer that you would stop existing is superior I to agree. the answer that the space would expand. I agree. I agree. Um, okay. But both of those are wrong. Okay. And the reason that they're both wrong is that the boundary that you're talking about doesn't exist. Yes. So yeah. like, it's not, it's yes. If you could get to the, to the boundary, which is an abstract idea between existence and non-existence and you stepped over it, I, I reckon you'd just stop existing. I don't I think mean, you'd yeah. extend existence into the realm of the non-existent. But the fact of the matter is that the realm of the non-existent doesn't exist. So the border to existence isn't anywhere. Right. It's the center is everywhere. Border is nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, to me, that's satisfactory. And I, I know that I spent a lot of time thinking about this, but trying to see other ways that along the way, at least when I was kind of developing this idea in my imagination, you remember I had a, a firm kind of conviction uh, to like- And nothingness. And nothingness. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do remember that. And I loved the idea of just nothingness as almost a uh, kind of a, a promise of infinity because as you know, my definition of eternity is without beginning or end. And I added, uh, I think it was your, your distinction about um, without border or boundary. Um, yeah, yeah, unbounded. Unbounded, thank you. So without beginning or end and unbounded. And then infinity is with a beginning or a beginning without an end. Let's call it that, a beginning without an end. Which to me is at least poetically significant to the fact that human beings were born we all have like a, an ontological birth date, if you will. And our, our end date is whenever it's gonna be. Um, but there's a weird promise thanks to things like the singularity or anything that's you know, kind of promised by transhumanism, stuff like that. So I look at things like a weird little digital mythos that could animate people's sense of a type of spirituality that is predicated on objectivity. That's kind of, I'm looking for that sweet spot that blends all the different categories together and doesn't bastardize any of them. Yeah, man, I definitely agree. I think that's a goal worthy of trying to attain.